So, we are in the home stretch of a series that we have been calling Deleting Destiny. And uh, the, the, the impetus has been to equip us to be a remnant of believers who overcome the deception of the devil. All right. And so over the past few weeks, we've been talking about areas uh, that the devil is prowling. Right. So we took a look at we, we talked about uh, digital addiction. Uh, we talked about being disturbed, which was a look at uh, mental illness. We talked about desire. Uh, we talked about uh, being uh, uh, disconnected, dysfunctional thinking. Last week, we talked about disillusioned. And this week, on Valentine's Day, on you know, this day of love, this uh, day of roses and chocolate and stuffed animals, I, like, I, I could have been given a D word like delight. Right. Like, like that, that would have been good. I could have used that. It would have been kind to give me on a day like today. That's not what they gave me. Or, or, or maybe that's not your testimony. Maybe uh, you don't have a lover. And so uh, days like these are actually really bad for you. And it's sort of a singleness awareness day for you, a day like today. And so they could have given me the word you know, disappointed or, or, or discouraged. I, I could have done something with that. that, that, that I could have did it, Alex. I'm telling you, it would have been doable. Oh, but no. You know what I got today? I, I'm just going to pour salt on everyone's game today. Because the word I've been given today is the word dirty. <laughs> Everyone say that with me. Dirty. dirty. Are you guys ready to go into this on Valentine's Day? I'm going to figure out how to tie this in. So just, just hang with me. Okay. Dirty is the word. Okay. So in, in John chapter eight, we are introduced to a woman who has been caught in the act of adultery. And what we're going to see in this moment of confrontation between a deceived woman and God in the New Testament is actually really similar to another moment of confrontation between a deceived woman and God in the Old Testament. And, and my hope is to expose what the devil is trying to do to her and how it shines light on what he ultimately wants to do to us. Amen? You guys good to go on the ride with me? All right, so John chapter eight, starting in verse one. All right, so Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, early in the morning, he came again into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And then they had, uh, had it set and they had her set in the midst, and they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now, Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and he wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. Verse 7 so when they continue asking him, he raised himself up and he said to them, he who's without sin among you, let him throw the stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Verse 10, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw that no, there was no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are your accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Let's pray. God, this song we sang this morning just gripped me. Um, where it says, you didn't want heaven without us. So you brought heaven down. Our sin was great, but your love is greater. So what can separate us now? Lord, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Help us to do that today. Lord, I know I, I'm a recipient of that rest, and I thank you for that rest. And I pray that everyone who is here today who knows that rest, Lord, may they be comforted by it today. And if there's anyone here, Lord, who doesn't know that rest, I pray that in the name of Jesus, 
by your spirit that they would walk out of here knowing what that is. We thank you, Lord, that you are the lover of our souls. And so on a day like today where we celebrate love, let us not forget the greatest act of love, Lord Jesus, and that's you and what you did for us on the cross. May that be clearly communicated today in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. 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 And so Jesus goes to the temple, and people begin to come. They sit down, and he begins to teach them. And the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they crash his lecture. They just walk right into what he's doing. And they bring in front of him this woman who's been caught in the act of adultery. And they say to him, the law of Moses, in the very act, they say. And they say, the law of Moses commands that we should stone such women. But what do you say? And Jesus, he gets down on the ground. He starts writing in the dirt. Now, as I started to study this, I thought to myself, what is Jesus doing? Why, why does Jesus do this? Why does he get down on the ground? And as I was studying this uh, in my own study, I couldn't figure anything out. And so I started researching what commentators say. And, and there are so many theories on what was going on there, but no one really knows. No one really knows why he gets down on the ground and he starts writing. No one knows. But, but one thing is clear as I was studying what I saw is that this action of playing in the dirt is reminiscent of the creation story in Genesis chapter 2 where it says that the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living being. And it was in the garden that the devil schemed to present us as dirty and then to accuse us to God. It's in the garden he did that. Eve was deceived, but Adam sinned. And Adam, whose name literally means earth. Uh, he was formed by the dirt. And then because of sin, dirt became his condition. Are you following me? He sins and dirt becomes his condition. And now he and Eve are dirty. And it must have pained God tremendously. It must have been hard on God. That moment where he had to pronounce the curse on humanity because something happened to Adam in that moment. Something happened to all of us in that moment when God said, for dust you are and dust you'll return. But there was a glimmer of hope because as he pronounced that curse onto humanity, he also looked at the deceiver, Satan. And this is what he said to Satan. He said, I am sending someone who will sustain a fatal blow from you. But at the end of all of it, he's going to crush you. I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. Someone's Jesus. Amen. If you're wondering who that person is. All right. So Jesus, Jesus embraces us by taking on our dirt. Like, like he, the Bible says he literally took our flesh upon himself. And he would eventually take our spiritual dirt, our sin upon himself on the cross to die, to cleanse us and redeem us back. Amen. And so in the same way, that, that he has come to write God's law on the human soul. Jesus is also now writing with his finger in the dirt. This woman is brought before him and there seems to be some validity in the charges against her. Yeah. Uh, the, there's almost no attention given to whether or not she's innocent. Her, her guilt is assumed. Her guilt is assumed. And when you talk about the, the assumption of guilt, there's almost universal agreement about the same issue concerning humanity. Virtually every culture and every religion concedes this. We all agree that there is something wrong with us, that, that we too are dirty. We are bad to the bone. We are naughty by nature. We're dirt bags. <laughs> right? uh, because of our descendants, we are rotten to the core. That was funnier in my head when I was <laughs> trying to hit every generation here. You, you know. This is who we are. And Jesus finds himself in an interesting situation here. He's being asked to answer the age old question. What will God do with the dirt of humanity? And the way that Jesus deals with this woman in this story is the same way that he deals with us. And so I want to show you guys, I want to show you the trap, the trial, and the triumph. All right? The trap, the trial, and the triumph. All right, so first, let's look at the trap. All right? 
So they come to Jesus and they say, teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now, Moses in the law, he commanded that we should stone such women like this. So what do you say? And Jesus gets down on the ground. And he starts writing in the dirt. See, this woman was caught in the very act, it says, of adultery. And so why is this important? The reason why this is important is because the Jewish law knew that capital punishment was an easily abused penalty. And so it, it was incredibly difficult to convict someone of capital punishment, uh, to, to, uh, of, a, of a, capital, a capital offense, because the laws of evidence were so generous. It was actually a more merciful law than our own jurisprudence, because at least uh, in our law, you have to convince a jury of probable cause. Yeah. Not so in Jewish law. In Jewish law, it wouldn't be enough to see her coming out of his hotel room doing the walk of shame. That wouldn't have been enough to convict her. It, it wouldn't have been enough to see them lying in the same bed. That would not have done it. No, no. In the law of Moses, it says that the two witnesses who completely agree with one another have to actually see them in the very act of adultery. Right? And they did. They saw her. And so this is a brilliant trap, right? They reference the law of Moses, which says that she should be stoned. And it does. It says so in, in Leviticus 20. It says so in Deuteronomy ch uh, chapter 22. And so what did Jesus do? What can Jesus do? Because if you trample on this woman, or you can trample on the law of Moses, what do you do here? And he knows this, that, okay, if I, if I side, uh, you know, with the woman and I let her go, then now I have the Sanhedrin that comes after me. And now I can be guilty of capital punishment. They could try to kill me. But if I have this woman stoned, then that's a problem as well, because now the Romans will come after me. We're under their occupation. And so Jesus is screwed. He, it's probably not the right word to use when you're talking about <laughs> adultery. He's in a, a world of trouble. He's in trouble here. So Jesus' ministry had grown by his message of compassion and grace, right? In Matthew chapter 11, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest, right? But at the very same time in his message, he talks about being the fulfillment of the law. Matthew chapter five, he says, I am the fulfillment. I did not come to abolish it. I came to fulfill it. And so how does he hold these two things together? This is what he's up against here. How does he hold them together? And it says that they did this to test him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. See, the religious leaders meant to deceive Jesus, that they wanted to put him in a no-win situation. And in an effort to get him, they had become bloodthirsty in their desire to shame and punish this woman who had fallen. Let me suggest to you that this is who Satan is. This is who Satan is. The, the Hebrew word for Satan means accuser or adversary. That Revelation chapter 12 calls him the accuser of the brethren. That, that this is who he is. One of his most common and wicked schemes is to tempt us, to make us fall, and then to accuse us to God. And so these men are aligning themselves with Satan. This is what they're doing. This woman is caught in sin. And for their own gain, they want to see her shamed, punished, and killed. Dare I say, canceled. You know that word, right? Cancel culture, man. Cancel culture, is, it's this, uh, this modern phenomenon. It, it really has only taken shape in the last couple of years. And it came into our collective consciousness uh, back in about 2017 as sort of a cultural boycott against, you know, certain concepts and companies and, and celebrities who were, uh, you know, really lashing out and were becoming problematic because of their actions and statements. And uh, as social media culture grew, so has cancel culture. It's grown. And then it became politicized. Right. And it made its way into mainstream media or mainstream politics, uh, really in the wake of the election year. And I'm, I'm just going to tell you guys, it has gotten completely out of control, completely out of control. Right. And so to quote a tweet from 2017, this is 2017, but it so speaks today. 
It says, cancel culture is so toxic, you can't even learn from your mistakes anymore because you're not even allowed to make any. But now here's the worst part. Can I give you the worst part? Here's the worst part. Cancel culture has now infiltrated the church. And it is repulsive. It is repulsive. And the reason why it's a problem, and the reason why it's repulsive, can I tell you why? It's because religious people are really, really good at it. <laughs> religious people are really, really good. I mean, think about religion, okay? In light of the gospel, let's talk about religion for a second. I wanna, I wanna connect the dots for you, just follow me, okay? Religion thinks in terms of good people and bad people. The gospel only has repentant and unrepentant people. All right, religion depends on what I can do to be justified. The gospel depends on what Jesus has done to justify me. Religion has the goal to get things from God. The gospel has the goal to get God. Religion is about me. The gospel is about Jesus. Religion is about optics. It's about appearing as a good person. The gospel is about purity, honesty, and authenticity. Religion ends in pride or despair. The gospel ends in humble joy. Religion sees uh, uh, Jesus as the means. The gospel sees Jesus as the end. Listen very carefully to me. The church of Jesus Christ are not a religious people. We are a gospel people. That's who we are. That's who we are. There we, there we. You guys have improved in one service. This is so good. See, the reason why religious people are so good at cancel culture is because cancel culture is the modern day religious spirit. Cancel culture is religion in secular dress. It's, it's, it's finger pointing, it's shaming, it's, it's punishing someone who has already fallen. And it's a sure way to align yourself with the one they call the accuser of the brethren. And uh, so maybe you really believe that by not buying someone's stuff anymore, that they're going to repent. Maybe you really believe that by calling them out on their social media post or, or lowering their friend or follower count is going to somehow get them to come to their senses. Stop. No. You're being a jerk. There's nothing righteous in it. There's nothing righteous. And, and look, I, I'm not trying to get us to hate Pharisees. Uh, matter of fact, and this is what I'm learning too, is one of the ways to become a Pharisee is to hate a Pharisee. So that's not what I'm trying to do. That's not at all what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to do is trying to show you guys that, that this is how deception works. This is how it works. If you don't own your own sin and address your own sin, the only thing you're left to do is to focus on someone else's. The only cancel culture that Christians should be engaged in is summed up in the last phrase of what Jesus said to this woman. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That is the way of Jesus. How do I know that's the way of Jesus? Thanks for asking. Let me tell you. Because when they brought this woman to Jesus, what did Jesus do? Jesus got down on the ground. Jesus didn't put himself on the same level as this woman. He got in the dirt. He went lower than this woman. Jesus is well acquainted with all of our sins and all of our stains and all of our flaws and all of our dirt. And you know what Jesus does with that? Jesus, though he should probably withdraw, you know what he does? No, he draws near. That is the only cancel culture that I want to be associated with. This is who Jesus is. And so they tried to trap this woman in an effort to trap Jesus. That's what they try to do. Second, the trial. Let's see what Jesus does. So Jesus, he's riding in the dirt. And they continue to harass him. And so he stands up and this is what he says to them. He says, he who's without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and he started riding on the ground again. And then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, starting with the oldest, even to the least. 
in order for this woman to be caught in adultery, she almost had to be set up. Right? She, she almost had to be set up. Right? The, the, the dead giveaway is that the man wasn't there. Right? The law of Moses says that both the man and the woman are to be executed. So the question is, where's the man? Where's the man at? Either they saw the act and only brought the woman, which the Bible calls the sin of partiality, which is a condemnable evil, right? And so they either saw the man and only brought the woman, or they were false witnesses, right? And so without the man there, there's almost no way that they were without sin themselves, right? And so he absolutely, Jesus absolutely honors the law because when we hear him say, he who's without sin cast a first stone, maybe we think in our heads that he's diminishing the law, but can I tell you? No, he's actually quoting it. He's quoting the law. Now, as I was reading this, I got stuck on this for a while. This was the hard part for me. I said, just thinking logistically of how to pull all this off. If, I, if I'm a scribe, I'm a Pharisee, and I'm trying to do this to Jesus, I know how much work went into pulling this off, right? You have to somehow entrap this woman. You've got to get her to get into this adulterous affair, right? And you have to catch her in the act of that. Then you have to drag her out. You've got to know when Jesus is going to be in the temple. You've got to go to the temple. You've got to call Jesus out in front of everyone. All right, this was a lot of work that they put in to do this. And in one statement, Jesus shuts the whole thing down. So what is it about this statement then? He who's without sin, go ahead and throw the first time. Well, what is it about this statement that got these guys to do this? When Jesus says, let him who's without sin cast the first stone, he could not have meant. And they did not understand him to be saying that if you have any sins in your life at all, Go ahead and throw the stone. They wouldn't have been convicted by that. He couldn't have meant that. But in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and chapter 13, it says that you yourself can't be an adulterer if you are going to judge and kill someone for adultery. Jesus knows that this is a, a culture where there are double standards for women. And, and commentators agree on this, that, that he was very likely saying to these guys, I know who you are. And I know you guys are adulterers too. He's calling them out. I know you guys are adulterers too. And so the reason why they are convicted enough to drop it and walk away is because Jesus is saying, I do not deny the law of Moses. But by the law of Moses, I deny you the right to be her judges or executioners. And they had to drop it. And they left. They tried to expose Jesus. They, they tried to expose this woman. But because they wouldn't name their own sin, Jesus exposes them first. And that's a lesson for all of us. Because if you don't name your own sin, Jesus will have to name it for you. So we look at the trap, we look at the trial, and lastly, the triumph. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw there was no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are all those accusers of yours? Did, did, did none of them condemn you? No one, Lord, she said. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So before this woman was set free, there is joint acknowledgement of her guilt. Jesus knew and she knew that she had been caught in adultery. But this is what he says to her. He says, go and sin no more. We see that and, and we probably think to ourselves, man, how nice. Jesus just let this woman go, right? But it's not that easy. Forgiveness always comes at a cost. It always comes at a cost. There's no way that she could just go scot-free. See, because the law says that you're either guilty and worthy of death or not guilty and not worthy of death. But Jesus says to this woman, you are guilty, but you can go free. I will not condemn you. Are, are you guys following me on what's happening here? So every other religion says either you're not guilty and you're not condemned or you're guilty and you're condemned. But you know what a Christian is? A Christian is someone who was guilty and not condemned. That's what a Christian is. 
That if you're a Christian today, you are a sinner and yet you are utterly accepted. Paul says this in Romans 8.1. He says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How can this be? How can this be? How can we be guilty and not condemned? How, how, can we, uh, how can Jesus avoid trampling on the law and at the same time avoid trampling on this woman? Let me tell you how. Because Jesus, as an innocent, sinless man, will give himself over to be trampled on. That's how. When Jesus lets her go, he's saying to her, I do not condemn you because I will be condemned for you. I'll be condemned. You won't feel a single stone of God's wrath because I will be crushed under the mountain of the wrath and justice of God for all human sin. Paul in in 2 Corinthians, he says that Jesus, he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's what's happening here. Jesus refused to judge her because he would one day take that judgment on himself on the cross. Only he could relent in condemning her because he would one day take on her condemnation. This woman was humiliated by her dirt, humiliated by her sin, but Jesus took on all of humanity's humiliation on the cross. Bruce Shelley uh, is an author, uh, or was an author, senior professor of of church history and, and professional theology. This is what he says about Christianity and Jesus. He says, Christianity is the only major religion to have its central event, the humiliation of its God. He did that for us because of our dirt, because of our sin. When Jesus hung on the cross, it was the physical and visible representation of his statement, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. We're going to pray in a minute. But before we do, I think there's an invitation here. So will you just stand with me? I want to give you guys just a quick application as we shut this down. Because I thought to myself, man, all this stuff happens to this woman. She's entrapped, so she commits adultery. She's entrapped. She's brought in front of Jesus and all these other people publicly, publicly shamed, humiliated. Jesus shuts the whole trial down. And he looks her in her face and he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, what I wonder to myself is, man, was she, was she really able to do it? Like, with all that that happened to her, when she left, was she able to actually stop sinning? I thought about that. But here's what I believe. I believe the power to sin no more is in the order that Jesus said it. Now, just listen to me. It's in the order that Jesus said it. See, the devil would have you believe that you must clean yourself up for God to accept you. All right, he wants you to take all of your your sin and all of your dirt and all of your habits to the law instead of the cross. He wants you operating in the religious, lifeless method of go and sin no more and then I won't condemn you. He wants us thinking that Jesus is saying to us, I I, I won't condemn you you if you stop sinning. But that's not what Jesus says to us. You know what Jesus is saying to us? Jesus is saying, I do not base my love on your behavior No, no, no. I want you to base your behavior on my love. And so if you're here today and you've got dirt, just FYI, we all have dirt. If you have an enslaving sin or habit and you say, man, if I can only get rid of this, then God will love me then you need to know that God doesn't work that way. He doesn't work that way. And you'll never get over your habit. You'll never get over your sin. You'll never cleanse the dirt that way because you're operating in fear and you're operating in your own power. Doesn't work. 
But if you see that Jesus says to you, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. If you see that that's what he says to you today, then you will see that he's giving you the grace and the acceptance before you overcome the sin. And that act alone will melt and change and transform and cleanse you and you will actually be able to go and sin no more. And so if you're here today, with all heads bowed, all eyes closed, if you're here today and you say, Sean, I know I have dirt. I know that I am so like this woman. Or I know that I'm like the, the scribes and Pharisees. I know that I'm guilty before God. There's an invitation right now that Jesus is saying to you, I will take all of it on myself. I will free you completely. Come to me. I will fulfill the law. I will take it all on the chin, but at the very same time, I will set you free, but you have to come. And so if that's you today, all heads are bowed, all eyes are closed. Just slip your hand up. I just wanna pray for you. I just want to pray. I see you. I see you guys. I see you in the back. I see you, brother. Come on. Just slip your hand up. I just want to pray for you. I'm not going to call you out. I see you, brother. I see you, man. I see you. Maybe you're here today and you would say, Sean, I know that I've received this grace. That I, I've had an understanding in my life of this idea of being set free. But man, I, I've been caught up in some stuff and I just need a, a fresh start. I need to be cleansed afresh. That's you today. Come on, let's handle business. If that's you today, just lift your hand up. I want to pray for you too. Amen, I see you. I see you, sister. I see you, brother. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the people of God. I thank you, God, that the way that you address this woman is the model. It's the way that you deal with us. And I thank you, Lord, that you saw the worst of her and you got down where she was. I thank you, Jesus, that you became dirty for us. You were hung on the cross for our dirt. You were buried in the dirt and rose from the dirt to deliver us from ours. And then you look at us and you say, now I don't condemn you. Go, sin no more. And then you empower us by your spirit to do it. There are those in the room right now, Lord God, that need that truth to completely come in and Lord, just drive that truth like a nail in their heart today. On a day like today, Valentine's Day, the day of love, help us to understand fully what your love has come to do in our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name, and everyone said.